Welcome back to Home on the RNG. Oh, hello. Hi. Kind of scared me there for a minute. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to scare you. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to Applebee's. Well, welcome back to the beginning of Sequel Palooza. Yay. Ten exi- games that are the second in the series that we have pl- already played the first game of. I'm excited for this because many a game series, at least trilogy, the second one is the best one to me. If you've been listening and going, when are they going to play the, the, the next game in that series? This may be your chance. These next 10, we are going to bust out some sequels. Oh, yeah. I, I don't have an out. Are you going to talk about a flower again? I don't have an exit plan for that. Hey, today we're talking about Wild Arms 2. Yay. Let's go ahead and dive into personal history. I I got nothing. Uh, This is my first time to ever play this game. Okay, fun. Uh, It was developed by Media Vision and published by Sony in 1999. That's what I have for Wild Arms 2. Fair enough. Are you looking at me to talk? Okay, so... No, not yet. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. I um, I didn't play this until the virtual console <clears throat> on, like, the PS3. Because back in when this came out, I had, the, I had enough money to buy this or Kudelka. And I bought Kudelka. How do you feel about that decision now? I probably made the wrong decision. <laughs> no. <laughs> Financially, it's the right decision. Yeah, um, yeah. So I just, I just remember that in particular. I'm like, I was just, just remember being at Target and being like, should I get Wild Arms two? Because I had played and enjoyed Wild Arms one, or should I get Kudelka? And I got Kudelka. Well, there you go. How about you, Chris? You got anything? Oh, hi everybody. I'm Chris Taylor. Uh, Chris is with us. <laughs> I I make a big deal of introducing him on the first recording session of the day, and then I forget. Yeah, we've done 20 games so far today, so... Russ is very tired. You know what (laughs) will actually end it for me? Is if you make me play the original version of Hyperdimension Neptunia, the first one. You've already knocked all of those games out. We're not playing any of them. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, and I'm just (laughs) saying that that is what will knock me off. Although I do still have Hyper Devotion Noir on our list. Okay. I don't even know what that is. It's the strategy RPG spinoff. Okay. So you're really trying to knock me off. (laughs) You could just do Valkyrie Rose. That's the uh, that's that one game that's uh, what the PS4. And is that what oh, it's I called? That one. I would do Fairy Fencer F. I love Fairy Fencer yeah. F. Advent Dark Force. It's, really it's on the list. We'll okay. get to it. Yeah, I'll one do day. Fairy Fencer F. and and Refrain Chord. Although it's not as good, it's still good. Isn't it strategy? Is it, it is. like strategy? And Death Again, End I Request and, and no American voice acting. Oh, well, I don't really care about that. But I, I do. Just, <laughs> I love oh. the voice acting in Fairy Fencer F. Oh, yeah. Well, yes. I totally understand that. Harley Harl. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Yeah, so Wild Arms 2. uh, I own this game on the Sony PlayStation, and I have yet to play it because I have not finished or even purchased the first one. Hmm. Uh, Except that I got it on PS5 for free as part of the PlayStation Plus program. And I think that one is just available to everybody mm-hmm. because I have like the lowest tier of PS Plus right now, and I can still play Wild Arms One and Two. Yeah, I to s- my heart's delight. I still want to download it for real though because it, I might not have PS Plus for a while. Um, yeah. So I do need to. I actually just want to buy a PlayStation One copy of it and play through that. But yeah, uh, so I have not touched Wild Arms Two, even though it proudly sits on my shelf, mm-hmm. collecting yeah. dust. And we've all got the backlogs. Uh, let's go ahead and move into story and characters. Mm-hmm. 
getting that in stereo. When a terrorist group threatens the safety of the world, it is up to a single nobleman to gather a small independent army to fight back. Sure. The game takes about 45 <laughs> hours to beat. <laughs> and those are the highlights. That's, for, that's what I've got. <laughs> Wonderful podcast, everyone. <laughs> yeah, I did. I apparently completely failed to take notes on the characters at all. Oh. Hey, Russ, tell me about the characters. Yeah, they're, they're nice. They have... Um, they don't have a silent protagonist. No, and there's more there's of them thing. this time around. There are, yeah. The The game makes you think that you're just going to have a party of three because it does the same thing as Wild Arms 1 where you play kind of an intro. Uh, you po- play like a prologue of your three main characters. Um, but then you actually get three more as the game goes on. Ashley. <laughs> Ashley is your blue-haired boy. Um, Brad. Blue-haired boy. Yeah, <laughs> Brad. Uh, the the fierce mercenary Brad. Brad. Yeah, I love, I love that. I feel like maybe in Japanese, Brad or Brado, Blado, yeah. whatever, is a is a tough name. It probably because sounds like it. Yeah. In Trigun, there's a character that's this big hulking man, and he's Brado. Brado. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, and then my favorite of the of the first three characters, Lilika, is your is your mage goofy little girl she fights with an umbrella mm-hmm. i love when when female characters fight with umbrellas it's just what a weird niche interest like, princess peach has done it there's if you've ever played um arc rise fantasia which we need to play at some point there's a villain who fight a girl who fights with an umbrella i'm she- sorry to say that my favorite application of fighting with an umbrella is currently under a kind of spoiler embargo. So, Oh, okay. <laughs> so I won't say what, but I will say I, I share this sentiment. I enjoy umbrella yeah, I like as weapon. I even like in the, in that Robert Downey Jr. Sherlock Holmes movie when he mm. like fights with an umbrella for a minute, or is it a cane that he uses? Anyway, we're really getting off track. <laughs> it's fun. Um, but yeah, those are your like three main characters. And then there's also Tim who's awful. Um, I, but his name doesn't have to be Tim. Right. Yeah. This game has, I mean, I think I had this under innovation, but it's fine. This game, in addition to naming your main character, also has you name a handful of regular NPCs, yeah. like uh, <laughs> Ashley's love interest. Yes. You yeah. get to just name her. She never joins the party. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you name, like, the three local boys. Yeah. And one of them ends up joining your party it's much Tim. later on. Yeah. I was, the first time I played it, I was very surprised that Tim was suddenly a member of my party because I never liked him anyway. And I'm like, oh, God. This I love the idea of naming like significant that. NPCs, though. Yeah. That's pretty cool. And I haven't seen that before. Final Fantasy VIII kind of does that yeah. in a weird way where you can name, like, Angelo and you can name Griever. Um, I think I've forgotten thing. most of eight. Well, <laughs> it's, it's still there. Wonderful. It, it's, so I don't know coming. how you've forgotten. Um so yeah, those are like your three main characters, and then Tim, and then Cannon, um, is a cyborg Cannon is a fun, yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, <clears throat> good characters overall, and and the story is pretty good. I mean, it is essentially you become a private army of heroes, and the the game tries to explore a lot of what is a hero. Mm-hmm. Um, I do find I found the translation to be not great in places. Yeah. Sometimes it was fine. Other times it was like, okay, they are really trying to explore the um, philosophy of what is a hero, but I can't understand the sentence I'm looking at. <laughs> sort of like playing Breath of Fire 2. They are, they're, they're trying to say a lot of interesting stuff. If only I could understand yeah. any of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the translation comes and goes in its usability. <clears throat> But let's go ahead and move into the combat system. (gasps) A little bit like Final Fantasy VII, characters build up force points by either dealing or taking damage. Uh, in the pa- in the previous game, the force points would build up to a certain level, letting you perform special actions, but they had a separate numerical value. Like, they were separate from right. MP. Mm-hmm. Here, 
FP and MP are the same the thing, same. essentially. Yeah. So you build it up by taking or dealing damage, which is great for uh, something that fuels your abilities because it means you don't have to worry about, oh, what if I run out of mana in this fight? No, take or deal some damage. You'll build it back up. Yeah. You're fine to go. Um, you also get special abilities that unlock over the course of the game that take multiples of 25 FP. So the FP builds up numerically, but it also has like levels 1, 2, 3, and 4 mm -hmm. at 25, 50, 75, and 100. So regular abilities take <clears throat> some amount of FP. Right. Super abilities take levels of FP, if that makes sense. Yes, like Lilica with her spells. She's a very viable mage because, again, she can kind of just restore her, quote, MP over the course of the battle through taking damage, <clears throat> and all of her basic spells take, like, eight. Yes. Take, like, eight force points or something like that to cast your basic elemental spells. But if you're using that all the time, you're probably not going to build up to the higher levels to do the exactly. really cool stuff. Right. Uh, just like the last game, there are also guardian spirits that you can find. Lots of, lots of lots hidden of guardian them. spirits. Yeah. Lots of secret guard, And they give you uh, stat boosts and, well, they affect your stats because some will boost this and de decrease that. Uh, but they also give you special moves like pickpocket or throw. Mm -hmm. So, uh, kind of giving your characters job classes a little bit. A little bit. Every boss character gets a cool introduction cutscene. <laughs> yes. Where, like, <laughs> you see the silhouette, and it moves around, and then it gets a fancy, like, legend... It's so menacing. Legend of like Zelda-style name and title. Silhouette over red background. Yeah. And menacing music. Uh -huh, and yeah. then it's like... Thunder Killer Beast Guavar <laughs> right. or something. This might be the first game because like Trails does this all the time now, but this might be the first game where I encountered that where you, they like give you the name of every monster, the title, and it's yeah. it's super cool. And some of the titles are really disturbing. Also, bosses all have multiple body parts. Mm -hmm. You can kill the boss just by killing the main body. But you get bonuses if you kill off all their body parts first and then kill the main body. So, of course, that's what I always did. Of course. They actually lose abilities as you take out body parts. But in a couple of cases, like, oh, you killed both its arms. Now it can use its super attack. Right. <laughs> Every round of combat, you can change everybody's equipment or who is currently in your party in combat. Mm -hmm. They have, this game has a lot of really great quality of life oh, stuff yeah. like that that you would not see commonly for another few years. And what really, I don't, it's not that I love this when it's in a game, it's that I hate it when it's not in a game. Mm -hmm. But whoever's not in your current combat party still gets experience. Right. That's how that should always have mm -hmm. been. Or it should be like it is in Trails, where if you haven't been using a character, you can fight one battle and, and they the just experience scales, like sure. you can in gain style, like yeah. 10 levels in one battle. Sweet it in style is my favorite way. Yes, I like that one too. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Now, unlike the first game, because the first game had, you had three characters in your party. Each of them had a different combat style. One had a gun. One had his special techs. One had her magic. magic. Yeah. That was it. Well, here, like two of them, I think, Thing. maybe three three of them have arms yeah three, three of them, them have, have guns now they're different arms but but it's the same system it is the same system that, that's a little disappointing but how are you going to come up with six completely unique but this is the wild systems? arms too so the arms have to be wilder oh god <laughs> so and they succeeded i think so i feel like the characters in terms of mechanics are less differentiated are. but what it really does is it makes any party configuration valid. Yeah. Which I don't feel like in any game where you have multiple party members to pick from, there's usually a couple of like, okay, you don't want that person and that person in your party. You're just going to get wiped out every time. Uh, this game doesn't really have that. There, mm -hmm. Any combination of characters, yeah. it's valid. And I mentioned in our roundup review how I wanted to have like an emboss where you use all of your party members. They do that here. Mm-hmm. 
And there's even a secret recruitable party member. And if you don't get the secret recruitable vampire party member, you have to go up against one of the end bosses with just two people in your party. Mm -hmm. You'd be in some deep trouble. That's great. I mean, it, I would like to point out. It still looks like chibi Final Fantasy VI. Well, it does, yes. And I would like to say that for the fact that it does not look as good as like the Final Fantasy games from this era, I think they were really in love with their own like battle animations <laughs> because battles do move really slow. <laughs> I feel like because they have to do elaborate dances and things every time they cast a spell or use an arm or something there, it just, yeah, it struck me when I was replaying it for this, that well, I'm like, okay, Lilica, you can just fire off that fireball. You do not have to twirl your umbrella <laughs> around your body uh, before you do that. The Man. boss battles do all kind of get samey, too. Like, you they adopt do. the same strategy for right. everyone, yes. which is just, hey, Brad, use your rocket launcher. Lock on so you don't miss and use your rocket yeah. launcher. Uh, use these spells to buff the party. Use mm -hmm. that gun. Yeah. Uh, it, it is often just the same strategy over and over. So, yeah, the combat it, the combat is not the highlight of the game. Well, it's not. I'm not even, I'm not really knocking the combat because I don't mind a game where you're just kind of doing the same thing over and over because I might have ADHD. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, I'm just saying, like, oh, my God, I have to watch you twirl your umbrella again so that you can cast a spell. I had this under innovations, but we can... The game has a pretty low encounter rate, honestly. Does, yeah. There are times uh, where I'd be in like a level of a dungeon, and I'd be like, are there no encounters in yeah, this dungeon? Um, what's weird is they, they pop an exclamation point that's over exactly your character's head. I was going to say. I love this. Yes. A white exclamation mark is a normal battle is about to happen, and you can actually cancel it you out. You can cancel it. I love it. Yeah, you I can avoid it. getting in a battle yeah. by using any of your special tool actions, like from the first game, and that resets the RNG counter for mm -hmm. combat. Um, but occasionally, you'll get a red one that appears with no warning. That's the enemy surprising you. Mm -hmm. Uh, you get a green exclamation point if you're about to encounter an enemy you've never seen before. Uh, at first, I thought that was me getting uh, a surprise attack a on surprise them. A surprise attack that would. But no, sense, it's the game not, saying you've never seen this enemy, mm -hmm. and that's I don't think I've seen any other game that no. alerts you to hey, new enemy type. That'd be really helpful in like a trails game where you have to analyze every enemy and you yes. get like bonuses for it yeah i wish there was a anyway i wish there was a better way to know what you hadn't hadn't analyzed yeah. anyway uh so that's the combat system that's what i've got and they have the thing too where um well we already covered it never mind well now i want to know no just talking about the, the the exclamation point things yeah we already covered that. i thought there was one thing that we didn't mention but we did we just I have it in my no. I know. We, I know that we just talked about like it. I thought five some, seconds ago. I thought there was something else. Oh, what I was gonna say. What I was gonna add is that when we reviewed last time Persona Two One, I didn't like the little oh the, the, the counter. little counter where it like turns red because it made me nervous. But this with the exclamation points, I love mainly because you can cancel the battle if yeah. you just if you're just like I just want to get through this area. The dungeons are puzzly, and so. If you're like, I just want to solve the puzzle, leave me alone, yep. you can actually just make the monsters leave you alone while you solve the puzzle. Excellent. Speaking of puzzly dungeons, let's move into innovation. Yay. Uh, so we talked about getting to name significant NPCs. We talked about the encounter rate. But now there's a Star Ocean-like skill system. Mm -hmm. where Again, you, love it. You can purchase certain skills for characters. For example, one of the first ones you want to max out is the one that you gain extra HP every time you level mm -hmm. up. So you max that out so your characters will have really high HP at the end. Uh, there are ones that uh, increase your resistance to status effects That's or enhance other attributes. That I always max out first is the status effect, uh, not necessarily immunity, but the resistance to it. Because yeah, it I, it gets on my nerves when I have to stop and use an item or whatever to heal a status effect. But you can have like seventy five percent immunity. Yeah, 
to, to any status effect. Love that. When we're playing a game that I've never played before, I often go on the JRPG subreddit and just say, hey, I'm playing this for the first time. What are your thoughts? What are your memories like? What are lightly spoiler or spoiler free tips and tricks? Mm -hmm. And the first one everybody said was get the HP skill, max it out immediately because it makes the end of the game much more easy to handle. There are crystals you find laying around on the ground. Uh, And if you touch them, you heal HP. HP. Uh, Big crystals and little crystals. You just walk around picking them up and healing. Guess that's the trade-off because you can't use healing magic when walking around because you need FP to cast magic and you get FP when you're in combat, Mm -hmm. but you don't have... You're really relying on items to heal yourself. Yeah, outside of of combat. Other than the, the little crystals. And I just love, I love little crystals in any game. <laughs> Picking up little crystals. I play it like, um, I'm thinking of like the latest Star Ocean and you get those little Duma crystals. I just love walking around picking up little crystals. <laughs> they, there's a really weird mechanic in this game. And it's the discovery mechanic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where you can't see towns you haven't been to or dungeons you haven't been to on the overworld. Mm -hmm. You have to go to where they are and hit a search button, which does like an area of effect search. And it will reveal the town, provided you've met the requirements to know where that town is. A lot of times you have to like have talked to an NPC who will tell you where the town is. Which is, Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess it's to prevent sequence breaking. Sure. But there's just something really weird about the fact of I am standing in this empty field, <laughs> nothing around me for as far as the eye can see. Are you sure? Look closer. Oh, I am literally yeah. standing next to a giant village. <laughs> I don't know how I missed that. Or if you're like doing replays, you just have to kind of keep in the back of your mind all the NPCs you need to talk to to unlock the next town. <laughs> so I wrote a paragraph about this. But I, th- so, I feel like we've addressed it. I'm I just so found scared. it really, uh, oh, really about the, bizarre yeah, about like. It is uh, odd. Gosh, I was told there's a dungeon around here somewhere. Can you search? Yes, we are literally. I am standing within arm's length of a giant monolithic castle. <laughs> but I can't see it. I'm glad I, I didn't searched talk to for Joan it. Back yeah. in town. Now that we've talked to Joan, I can now see this castle I'm literally within touching distance of yeah. in this empty field. Mm-hmm. Thank sure. goodness. Yep. So one of the biggest complaints I had about Wild Arms 1 was there was frequently times, and this is the thing I hate most when it happens in JRPGs, <clears throat> when I have no idea where to go next or what to do next. Right? Mm-hmm. It's just wander the world, talk to every NPC, push a button on every square. You'll find something eventually. Right? The first right. three Dragon Quests are pretty bad about this. Yeah. Wild Arms 1 had a handful of moments like this. This game is really good about not doing that. Early on, you get a cell phone that lets you call your boss at any point, and he'll remind you what your objective is. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a point where you get the equivalent of an airship. You get a flying fortress. Mm-hmm. And there are a couple times where you can tell the flying fortress, hey, just take me to the next part of the story. Yeah. And it will just <laughs> autopilot so you neat. to the next dungeon that you're supposed to go to or the next village or whatever that the story has told. Instead of going, hold on, is there like a map I can look at online to tell yeah. me where the dungeon of Pharrell is? Mm-hmm. No, just take me there. All right, cool. On your way. There are a significant amount of optional guardians. Mm -hmm. Uh, I love when a game has hidden bosses. There's a secret recruitable character who has secret hidden tools that you can use to find and fight secret optional (laughs) bosses to give your characters their best weapons. It's almost like post-game content because to fight those secret optional bosses using the secret optional tool from the secret recruitable character, uh, they are harder than the end boss. Like, you have to... Which is... I always find kind of silly because it's like, okay, I need to be stronger than I need to be to beat the end boss to get these right. super cool weapons that I will then fight the end boss with, except now I don't need them. Yeah, true. Exactly. Um, Later games would make that system so that you could go fight the end boss and then all of that stuff would unlock. Yes. But we're talking about 1999. The end boss of the game is a gimmick boss, which is something we haven't had happen very often Mm -mm. right 
I, I don't know that we've ever even talked about gimmick bosses have before. We have we reviewed Chrono Cross? Yes. So, so we talked so about it yes. once. We talked about that gimmick boss, it's but been, I don't it's know. It's been a lot of episodes. I don't know now that we I, called it that specifically. Now I know, like when I listen to podcasts and people are like, have we done this before? I'm like, how can you <laughs> not know? But when you actually do it. Welcome to the newest episode of Middle-Aged Men Remembering Things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But in this case, this one is very earthboundy, right? Because mm-hmm. uh, it's a hard fight to lose, but your goal is to use one special move over and over again, summoning the power of friendship from everybody you've met <laughs> until the boss dies. It is basically earthbound. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So yeah, those are the innovations that I had. Well, I would also add just one of my favorite quality of life things in this game is Lil. I talk about Lilica a lot. Maybe she's my favorite character. I don't know. Um, does does Chris? Do you know if it's his favorite character? Uh, I've heard something to that effect, probably, oh, okay. but I cannot confirm uh, or deny. She's your mage, and she learns crest magic in the same way Cecilia did in yes. the first Wild Arms. So you have to find the crests, and then you go to like a witch, and she and you place the crests on a grid, and then you get magic based on that. You can just undo that anytime yep. you want. Um, Which is great when you unlock the more powerful spells. Exactly. Love it. Because you can go, you can be like, okay, I needed fire spells for this area. And then I haven't found a new crest yet. And then for the next area, I need water spells. Well, you can just go change that into water spells. Very convenient. You never, I love, because the crest system is a little annoying to me because it is like the hidden... A lot of them are hidden. Yes. You have to like. You have to find. You have to it's a finite resource. Things. It's a finite resource. Although you get to name each spell that you, you do make, which is spell. Yeah. kind of nice because it's you could just be like, cast me first, second. Yeah, that's very third. true. I never thought about that before, but that is very true. But I just find that an extremely useful quality of life thing that you didn't necessarily find in games back then. Love it. Very yes, much. being able to just change your mind with no penalty yeah. is great. Because I mean, again, I've been playing Final Fantasy VII rebirth colon rebirth and God, you every can time. just you can just reset and this is the thing that happens for the, the listeners the it's gonna now. sound like he's been playing this for months it will it will <laughs> it will sound like that i probably have especially with our current month. delayed schedule where we're only putting out one episode yeah. a month but you can redo you can redo all your skill points literally at any time you want in that game and i love it yeah not locked into anything let's move on to the most musical part of the review. The, music the graphics. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what if we reviewed graphics? I don't know. Of all of these games. This game had some very PS1 style graphics. It had some PS1 style. And she had to twirl that umbrella every single time she cast a spell. Yes. It was, it was very polygonal. Mm-hmm. We need to get a graphics person in here. Yep. We need a <laughs> graphical expert. I've got one more microphone. Let's do it. Yeah, music. So uh, this is going to be another short one because uh, I have not played this game. Well, we've spoiled the whole thing for you. Yeah, so that's have fine. Fun now. That's fine. I'll forget it all. <laughs> um, it's but, fun. You should play it. And, and this is compounded by the fact that uh, not only do we have a pretty similar soundtrack in this second game, but it's the exact same composer, Michiku Naruke, who is known for the Wild Arms series. And, according to Jeff's notes, a Wizard of Oz RPG I've never heard of until today. <laughs> um, That's for the... It's either for the Game Boy Advance or the DS. I can't remember which. Wizard yeah. of Oz. I'm going to check it out. But uh, And also, uh, as a special note, because we just did a, uh, a game with a soundtrack by Motoi Sakuraba, she's actually teaming up with him uh, for the... It will be released as of, I think, uh, the time any of these podcasts come out, but Ewood and Chronicles uh, 100 Heroes. Uh, so they're both doing the soundtrack to that, which is kind of great that they ended up teamed up in this group of, well, I guess this is a new season, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> Either way, I'm excited about that. But, yeah, so she did the soundtrack to this. Um, and she's coming back for the Wild Arms spiritual successor. Oh, yeah, Armed Fantasia. Um, oh, I which is what we got that. there. Yeah, they announced uh, basically a Suikoden spiritual successor and a Wild Arm spiritual successor at the same time. Hmm. 
And so both of those are approaching their release dates. I think we're uh, <laughs> we're pretty much hitting, um, you know, what do you call it? The Not the saturation point, but just like the peak of like old games being either remade or reimagined yeah. in, in today. They should and, have uh, called a Wild Arm spiritual sequel The Restless Legs. I know. <laughs> oh, dear God. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Always love to get the music in the music section. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so like like the last game, I mean, this is a lot of, uh, you know, it's since it's a Western, we've got a lot of flavors of like Ennio Morricone's like, you know, um, spaghetti Western themes. Mm-hmm. Literally one of the songs has the whistle in yeah. it. And y'all know which one. Um, but what I like about these soundtracks is that there's a real strong infusion of like this kind of the uh, basically Japanese like fusion kind of jazz that gets in there sometimes. And man, there's a lot of dungeon themes in this game too. Uh, since I hadn't played this, and I was like, man, are you just going to the dungeon like all the time? It just <laughs> once turns you out can find it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Once you find it, but yeah, once you do like. Man, you get some good themes going into those dungeons. This game goes pretty hard on the uh, on the grooves. Uh, you know, got lots of nice, cool rolling bass lines, cool synths and stuff. Usually an acoustic guitar, which the acoustic guitar, since this is the PlayStation era, you know, they always kind of sound a little bit dinky because, you know, we got middies, essentially, mm-hmm. going on yeah. here. And that's especially evident in, like, the slow, kind of sadder songs where it's just acoustic guitar because you just kind of hear it and you're like... Wow, I remember hearing this on a Windows 95, like, <laughs> midi. <laughs> but it is very, like, they're great tunes, though. And um, I believe that the person doing the whistling is actually a real whistle performer, like in the last game. And, of course, we have a couple of vocal themes, too, which are very nice. Um, there's also uh, special themes for certain battles. Um, again, since I don't know the story, I don't know the context, but... They're, uh, they're pretty darn good. And like I said, one of these is the one where you actually hear the spaghetti western whistle, which is, uh, which is pretty fantastic. Yeah. But yeah, ultimately, not a whole lot to say about the soundtrack. Like I said, it's... it's, it's Wild Arms. It's Wild Arms, and it's really good, but, uh, you know, like there's it's not a whole lot more of... more Wild Arms. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's not going to stand out super strongly from the first game, or I imagine the third game. <laughs> yeah. Too wild, too arms. Yeah. So let's go ahead and wrap this up with our final thoughts. I really like this game. Yeah, I like this is Wild Arms 1 was good and surprised me in a lot of good ways. And then this is what you want from a series. This game improves on all of the good aspects. It builds on them. It makes tweaks and changes. Yeah, I I gave this game an A-. I'm counting off for the spotty translation and the weird discovery gimmick. Mm -hmm. But an A- is still a damn good score. And it's a great game. It was very enjoyable. Uh, I, I the characters all felt like good viable party members. It's Lots of hidden optional stuff. A minus, great, great game. Yeah, Very, I I agree. I agree with all of that sentiment. I give it, I give it four twirling parasols out of five. Mm-hmm. Um, That's fair. Not not perfect. What I, could it have done to get the fifth? It, she could have stopped twirling her parasol <laughs> quite so much. The the having to watch ironic. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> Having to watch PS1 graphics uh, characters dance around to do their attacks was not the best use of my time. But, um, oh, but the game is fun. The game has, I give it a very high score because it has so much good quality of life stuff that everybody takes for granted now, but was not what you normally saw. And it has so much extra hidden content. So much like, hidden content. So like, much. When you said it 45 hours to beat, I can't believe that because I feel like I spent like 80 hours on this game. I feel like this was a long one. Well, I'm me. giving an average. Like, well, sure. That's, yeah. that's without taking the time to find and kill all the hidden bosses okay. using the hidden that's tool fair. from the hidden recruitable that's character. <laughs> I mean, that extra 35 hours is a lot of parasol twirling. So it, I can understand. It is a lot, indeed. Can understand yes. your uh, apprehension there. 
So, Russ, if they want to play Wild Arms 2. Well, if you have a PS5 or 4, I guess, you can just play it if you have even the basic um, PlayStation subscription. Um, I think it's just because that's all I have, and I have both of these downloaded. Um, and I think you can just download them all a cart too, right? You can. You can yeah, just get them all a cart. And then they have um, the functionality of like the Switch virtual console stuff where you can like create save states and things. So they're very, 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 very accessible. Um, if you have, if you have a PlayStation. So there you go. Honestly, this is a great kickoff to sequel Palooza. Really I'm is. really excited. I mean, it's we... fun to go back and visit these games and see the improvements they made. And I'm really excited about this. I'm, I'm glad you are. I am too. I like, again, I like, uh, sequels generally well great so. because the next game we're playing is also a sequel oh boy. <laughs> we're gonna be oh oh i can't right you just R- can't rush you read it i can't do it i can't i we're don't we're playing oh well you just made me eat my words oh god uh join us next time when we are playing romancing saga 2 why Womp womp womp. I guess we'll see you then. I'm so excited. Home on the RNG is a presentation of Mad Centaur Productions. You can find Jeff on YouTube at youtube.com slash centaurproductions or on Twitter at Jeff Centaur. You can find Russ on Twitter at RussMac25. You can find Chris on Twitch at twitch.tv slash liarexaggerate or on Twitter at EnrichFlavor. Thank you for listening and remember to save your game before powering off this podcast.